Hi all, I'd like to show you a very interesting and exciting game of Gary Kasparov played in the Fruins tournament of 1981. His opponent was Leonid Yudishin. Leonid Yudishin was born in 1959. He earned the IM title just the year after this game in 1982 and the GM title in 1984. He was the Leningrad champion also in 1984 joint winner of the 1990 USSR Championship and winner at Lyon in 1993, Israeli champion in 1994. So quite a decent player on his way to becoming an IM. He's playing Kasparov and he kicks off with E4. And Kasparov plays his favorite C5, the Sicilian defense. Recently, there's been a comment about the Sicilian defense being an unsound opening by one commentator on YouTube. I think the Sicilian defence strives personally to create imbalances at move one. It has been featured heavily in many World Championship matches as a weapon of choice. The asymmetry of it basically disguises the fact that white has an advantage and is saying that black can also play for a win and white can play for a win. So the advantage is now more complex than a more symmetrical position like e5. So let's see, knight f3, d6 d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight c3, and now we have the Nidorf, which is like the Rolls-Royce of Sicilian defence variations. There's minimal uh, structural weaknesses at the moment in Black's camp, and this flexibility of playing b5 later, depriving white of that b5 square, you can play in the centre with e6 or e5 later, and still has some other choices available. White plays bishop g5, and we see actually now e6. White plays f4 here, so it looks as though e5 is a very useful move. White might want to play later queen e2, or queen f3 usually, and castle queenside. Some sort of construction for castling queenside is often appropriate here, because that diagonal has been weakened a little bit by f4. Kasparov plays queen c7, now we see an early bishop takes f6. Let's just quickly check live book for this position. Queen f3 is actually a more common move with 513 games here rather than volunteering that dark square bishop. That's 423. So Kasparov's queen c7 is actually usually the poison pawn going for that poison pawn is very popular. Queen b6, the poison pawn variation, or bishop e7. Or knight bd7. This is quite quite a popular move. Queen c7, though. So queen c7. We see bishop takes f6. G takes f6. And now white plays actually bishop e2. More common here is queen d2. So we see bishop e2, knight c6. And now if white castles, he'll be in big trouble. Let's put on a kibitzer here. Castling kingside, which bishop e2 would seem to facilitate. Uh, has a rude awakening here in form of queen b6. What can actually white do about this pin here? He's given up the dark square bishop. He has no defense, it seems, available at all. That's a really nasty pin, uh, just to demonstrate that here, that white cannot castle kingside. He plays knight b3. b5 from Gasparov. So he's leaving this bishop at home. The rook has the flexibility sometimes to go to g8 here. And black might want to play either for b4 or bishop b7. We see an artificial looking move now, bishop h5. I say it's artificial because there's no actual amazing concrete threat with it at the moment. And the bishop, if it's not protected by the queen, uh, just wait for a moment. Um, if the bishop's not protected by the queen, it might turn out to be a bit of a tactical liability, you know, a loose piece is often a problem in chess. So will that become a loose piece later? We see Kasparov now playing bishop g7. And that seems, okay, it's for the moment blocked, but when there's an f5 in the future, this bishop will have a beautiful diagonal with no counterpart part for white. White's dark square bishop just volunteered away earlier. Now white's intention becomes a bit clearer. Queen g4. So if black dares castle, we'll be going straight into a pin. Can that pin be actually exploited though? Kasparov tests this. He does castle into that pin. White now castles queenside, and it looks as though there's an immediate rook lift 
which is very dangerous in theory. Black now plays, has to play a very precise move, I believe, because part of the move uh, is knight e7. He's facilitating the idea of f5. If ever e5, white can just simply play f5 and maybe carry on with this rook left, and that will be the end of black here, as well as shutting down his own bishop if there's e5, f5. So knight e7 has this idea that the queen can be threatened with f5 later. We see now knight d4, and I think we should take this opportunity to have a look at rook d3 here immediately. This is an interesting try. If, for example, f5, e takes, a knight takes f5 to prize the g3 square, but what about the h3 square? If rook h3, b4, this is an engine variation, knight e4, and in, in this position, if black doesn't play h6, I believe black could be starting to be in serious trouble here. For example, well, there might be one or two moves which are good defensively, but h6 is, is certainly one of them, maybe king h8 as well. But let's go with, say, black played bishop b7 in this position, just to see white's concept of this bishop pin. Knight f6 check is facilitated by that pin. King h8. And here there seems to be bishop g6, and this would offer white uh, an advantage. Black would have to be very careful in this position. For example, if h6, then bishop takes is big trouble. After e takes, queen g5, black's had it. This h6 is falling and black's king has had it. King safety is gone. That just shows it's quite dangerous, this concept that white has, potentially. But in this position, he doesn't go for this rook lift. Um, in that variation, though, a saving grace for black would have been after knight e4, h6. This deprives, actually, uh, that crushing uh, stuff I've just shown you. If knight f6 check here, then bishop g6 is, is okay. We've always got defensive resources, for example, taking and um, rook takes f6. We're defending on h6. We're not being threatened on h7. So just for the record, the rook left with rook d3 is fascinating to consider, but white played knight d4 here. Knight d4, Exparov played b4, chasing the knight away, and the queen's got a view on the c2 pawn. That's important to consider here, getting that knight out of the way. And now f5, and this is not what you might think as in an ordinary transaction on f5. Let's see. E takes F, and now what would you play here with black? If I gave you 10 seconds in this position, what would you play with black? So starting from now, you might want to pause the video. Kasparov's concept is actually a temporary pawn sacrifice with E5. He's pinning that pawn to the queen. There's no f6 here. And not only that, once the knight goes, he's got this beautiful bishop takes f5, coordinating with the queen on c2. So this is a potential disaster, this concept for white, this queen g4 and this bishop h5. It looked a bit on the artificial side. Sometimes in chess, artificial moves get rewarded, but maybe with active energetic play, sometimes these artificial moves, the downsides are brought out explicitly. And here I think we're going to witness that now. After f takes, d takes e5, the knight, does it move here? Well, if it moves, it's a bit diabolical. Let's say knight takes f3, bishop takes f5, we're double attacking the queen and threatening mate here. Whoops, that will be end of game immediately. So Yudasin, Yudasin plays queen g5, creating another threat of f6. How is this dealt with? Well, now this pesky move h6 comes to the rescue. Very important, this kicking the queen here to stop this f6. Queen g3, and now knight takes f5. And questioning this knight again, it, it takes on f5, and we get this beautiful bishop takes f5. Threatening now, queen takes c2, mate. White protects c2, and now uh, we see rook a c8 with the threat of bishop takes c2. White defends that, what else? Queen b3. And now 
you will see actually that this bishop is loose. Just bear that in mind on h5. And we see now after e4, this bishop is beautiful on this diagonal. Beautiful diagonal for the dark square bishop with no counterparts on the dark squares. We see now king b1, bishop e6. And what a fine complementary set couple of bishops here, eyeing b2 and a2. After queen g3, now we're seeing, uh, well, if white had played in this position, what, what else can white play in this position rather? If queen a4, for example, there's a killing move if this had been played, queen a4. I wonder if you can spot it. There's a kind of weakness of this last move. What is the queen neglecting? And what forcing moves could be very useful? If I gave you 10 seconds here, what would you play as black? Okay, queen e5 is a double attack on b2 and that loose bishop on h5. So even that is a is a way of losing the game now. That loose simply the loose bishop on h5 is is losing in some of these variations. The queen goes to g3, and here we are at the final move of the game, in fact. And I might have given you a clue already. What is black's final move in this position? If I give you 10 seconds here. Okay, queen a5 here hits h5 and a2. There's no satisfactory way of defending this position. And in fact, after say knight c1, the engines are suggesting there's an even stronger move than queen takes, even though queen takes is winning. There might even be even stronger in b3 first, knight takes, bishop takes, just winning that rook instead of the bishop on h5. It's stronger to take the rook and win near c2. So what a crushing win with the Sicilian defense. Some artificial moves by White, severely punished by that beautiful temporary pawn sacrifice in particular that Kasparov used in this game. So one of Kasparov's beautiful little miniatures in 1981. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.